Okay, now that we've um, talked about some of the ways that microorganisms can impact our energy resources, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, some of the ways that microbes can uh, contribute energy resources, and that is uh, by helping produce natural gas. So we're going to start out this uh, lecture by talking about pathways of natural gas formation. Well, there are two basic pathways by which natural gas forms. It can form biogenically. It can also form thermogenically. Biogenic gas is formed by methanogenic archaea, and thermogenic gas is formed by cooking organic matter. Okay, and This occurs at elevated temperatures, usually above about 70 degrees Celsius. And the main products of thermogenic gas formation are uh, water, CO2, methane, ethane, and then some higher chain hydrocarbon gases and liquids. Uh, for the most part, both of these pathways start with um, deposition of organic matter in sedimentary environments. After organic matter is buried, it begins to undergo microbial degradation. In this process, large molecules are broken down. Dismantled components begin to condense and form polymers, ultimately leading to formation of kerogen. Okay, and kerogen is a mixture of organic compounds that represents a form a major form of sedimentary organic matter. These low temperature processes occur within the realm of diagenesis where sediments begin to form sedimentary rocks and methane may form microbially. As temperature increases uh, as a result of burial, so these things are happening at relatively low temperature, if burial uh, happens and we start to increase temperature, eventually thermal degradation of organic matter starts to occur Okay, catagenesis is the physical and chemical alteration of organic matter at temperatures in the range of about 50 to 150 degrees Celsius. Okay, at these temperatures, chemical bonds break down in kerogen, producing oil and wet gas. Okay, so we're in the oil window here, and uh, wet gas is, uh, is the name given to natural gas that contains higher chain hydrocarbons as well as methane. And I'll talk a little bit more about what wet gas is in a few minutes. Um, in any case, if temperature continues to increase, eventually oil stops being produced. We pass the oil window, and um, we get to metagenesis, where dry gas is the uh, primary hydro hydrocarbon product of thermal degradation, and that is natural gas that contains low concentrations of higher chain hydrocarbon gases. Okay, ultimately, if temperature continues to increase, metamorphism starts to occur, which converts organic matter uh, that remains into graphite. We can get a sense of um, how much organic matter was cooked in the past using vitrinite reflectance. Okay, In other words, uh, this is a measure of thermal maturity for organic matter. Vitrinite is a component of most coals and carrageens, or coal and most carrageens, I should say. Uh, it's a, referred to as a macerol, which is basically a uh, homogeneous grain of organic matter. And uh, the abundance of, of vitrinite increases as organic matter is cooked. Okay, so we can measure the abundance of vitrinite in a sample to get a sense of thermal maturity. Um, and it's shiny, and so the way that uh, we can measure its abundance is by measuring the reflectance of light off of those vitrinite macerals in a sample. Okay, so the, the values of vitrinite reflectance are expressed as a reflection value. It's referred to as percent RO. Okay, and the values listed here approximate the boundaries between these different processes. The um, uh, major substrates for biogenic methane formation uh, fall into three categories. Uh, methanogens can use hydrogen formate or certain alcohols. They can uh, use methyl containing compounds like methanol or trimethylamine. Um, and they can also use acetate. And so let me just provide you with a, a few example reactions to, to illustrate these different substrates. So this is microbes using hydrogen as their electron donor and uh, CO2 as their electron acceptor to, to uh, produce methane. Here's a reaction with formate as the energy source. There's a reaction with methanol and then uh, an example with acetate. 
in each case, uh, the substrates are pro probably most of the time provided by bacteria. Okay, uh, methanogens can only consume a relatively narrow range of substrates. Okay, and so they need uh, fermenting bacteria to degrade complex organic matter uh, and generate these substrates for them. Methanogenic microorganisms um, are uh, exclusively uh, members of the domain Archaea and the phylum Euryarchaeota. There are five orders, Methanobacterialis, Methanococcalis, uh, Methanomicrobialis, and uh, Methanosarsanalis, and then Methanopyralis. The ability to use hydrogen oxidation coupled to CO2 reduction is nearly universal among these groups. Um, however, there are only uh, two genera within the order Methanosarsanalis that are capable of using acetate as their energy source. Okay, so how do we determine, uh, how can we distinguish between biogenic and thermogenic gas? Well, one thing that's useful to bear in mind when uh, evaluating the origin of natural gas is the thermal maturity of the source rock. Okay? If the source rock has low thermal maturity, there's a good chance that um, any methane there would uh, have a significant amount of uh, biogenic methane. Okay? There's a good chance that a significant amount of that would be biogenic. Uh, beyond beyond uh, thermal maturity, you can also get a handle on this based on the gas composition and also the isotopic composition of the gas, of the methane itself. Okay, um, Because both of these tracers of gas origin are a little bit ambiguous, um, it's a good idea to get uh, multiple tracers involved if you, if you have the chance. Okay, so let's start out by talking uh, a little bit about gas composition and what it can tell us. Okay, The typical hydrocarbon components of natural gas are methane, ethane, propane, and butane. Okay. Of these, methane is typically uh, the most abundant. Okay. It's the, the primary component of natural gas. Um, gas is, composition is often discussed in terms of gas wetness, which is calculated as shown here. The percentage of gas that is composed of methane is divided by the sum of the percentage that is composed of ethane and propane, C2 and C3. Uh, gas that has a higher abundance of these higher chain gases, hydrocarbon gases, um, uh, ethane, propane, butane, uh, is referred to as wet gas because those compounds condense out of the gas more easily than methane. Okay? So this means that, uh, putting this all together, this means that wet gas, uh, low, I'm sorry, low wetness values equate to wet gas Okay, because they have a higher abundance of these things. So that means that the denominator in this equation is larger. You end up with a smaller number overall. Okay, so let me illustrate this for you a little bit with some um, some data. Okay, and this data is uh, some data that I collected from the uh, Michigan Basin. The Antrim uh, shale is a major shale gas play there. So let's say we have two wells. Well, well A and well B. And here are our hydrocarbon components, C2, C, C1, C2, and C3. Okay, well, A, 83%, 83.1% methane, 4.25 C2, and then 0.08% C3. And then well, B, 89.8% methane, 0.06. And 0.02. Okay, so our equation again is C1 divided by C2 plus C3. Okay, so if we carry this through, A, we have 83.1 divided by 4.25 plus uh, 0.08. And if we calculate that, we get a value of 19. Okay, for well B. 89.8 divided by 0 0.06 uh, plus 0 0.02. And the value that we get there is 1,122. Okay, so uh, because 
this gas well, from well A has a higher abundance of um, ethane, um, it would be considered a wet gas. Okay, wet gas uh, with a low wetness value. Okay, well B has a low abundance of uh, both ethane and propane. Right, so you end up with a relatively high wetness, so this is wet, sorry. So you end up with a relatively high wetness number, and that's actually a dry gas. So those numbers are a little bit weird in that uh, dry gas has a high wetness value, but that's, uh, that's how it works. All right, let's go back to the slides. Advance, and then there we go. Okay, so how do we uh, interpret gas composition in terms of uh, what it can tell us about how that methane formed, how that natural gas formed. <clears throat> well, it seems that uh, microbes don't make higher chain hydrocarbon gases to a large extent. Okay, there have been a couple of studies that have shown that microbes can make ethane and they can make propane, but these don't seem to be major processes. The microbes are kind of uh, oriented towards ultimately producing methane. And so because of this, when you see low wetness values, it indicates a significant portion of the gas was produced thermally. So uh, we assume that that's the only way you can get these higher chain hydrocarbons is, is thermally, thermogenic degradation. And then when you see uh, high wetness values, okay, they're consistent with um, a biological origin of that gas. And let me stress the word consistent, okay, because there are some exceptions. Dry gas is not always biogenic. Okay, this is a little bit ambiguous. There are at least two instances where thermogenic gas would have a high wetness value. Could be that the gas formed during metagenesis, in which case it's dry gas that's being produced by thermal processes. And so if this is the case, you would expect to find that the source associated with that dry gas is very thermally mature. Let's say RO value is greater than about 2. And so if you didn't have that uh, mature source, then it could be that the, the gas is biogenic. Uh, on the other hand, it could also be that the gas formed uh, during catagenesis, but that the higher chain hydrocarbons were oxidized by microbes. So we talked about oxidation of oil leading to formation of heavy oil. Uh, it seems you know microbes can also oxidize the hydrocarbons, making up natural gas as well. And this could result in gas that has a higher wetness value. Okay, so there's a little bit of ambiguity there. All right, so how do we use isotopes to help us get a handle on this? Well, use of isotopes for tracers of methane origin is, is a little bigger topic than I want to go into extensive detail on here. Uh, we can talk about more, this more in class, but I do want to cover some of the main points. And the basic idea is that each step along a chemical pathway can have uh, a different isotopic effect. And because the methane formed in these different pathways has taken different routes, it can end up with distinctly different isotopic compositions. Okay? As such, the isotopic composition of carbon and hydrogen and methane can help us understand, to some degree, how methane formed. In general, the products of biologically catalyzed reactions tend to have a greater abundance of light isotopes relative to the reactants. And this is because molecules containing those lighter isotopes tend to be slightly more reactive. Okay, you think of them as choice substrates, for example. Uh, as temperature increases, this difference in the reactivity between lighter and heavier isotopes becomes less important. And so ultimately the difference in the isotopic composition uh, between reactants and products would tend to grow smaller. Uh, the data that I have plotted here brings out some of these relationships. I want to switch to the writing pad to kind of walk through this in a little bit more detail. So let me do that. I'm going to clear this off. And uh, let's just kind of recreate this graph <clears throat> a little bit here. So here's our x-axis. Okay, and our, I'm sorry, our y-axis and, and then our x-axis. 
go ahead and make a complete box. Okay, so over here we have hydrogen isotopes. Okay. This is the hydrogen isotopic composition of methane. Okay. And then over here we have the carbon, uh, carbon isotopic composition of, this, of methane. Okay, and let me just put some numbers on there. Um, the the numbers that were uh, that were shown there um, on the in terms of the y-axis, we had uh, minus two hundred down to minus three fifty, and then over here we go from about minus forty to about minus eighty. Okay, and the way to kind of think about these numbers is this. As you go down the y-axis, you basically uh, uh, you increase the proportion of hydrogen atoms in the methane that are isotopically light. Let's say, okay. so more light hydrogen. And we'll talk about this in class. But uh, basically. What I'm trying to say is, as these, as these, uh, as the number becomes more negative, it means that it's it's got a greater abundance of light hydrogen uh, atoms. And then um, over here on the x-axis, as you go from right to left, same thing. More light carbon. Okay, increasingly negative number. All right, and so the, the different um, uh, regions that I defined on that graph were we had a region over here, this is CO2 reduction. Down here we had uh, acetate fermentation. And then up here, thermogenic, right? Thermogenic gas. Okay, now. One thing that uh, I also want to add to this uh, that wasn't on that graph is I want to put kind of the field uh, that is kind of illustrates the isotopic composition of the source kerogen. And this is just uh, uh, some values I saw in the literature. S source kerogen up here, okay. Somewhere up here, um, maybe over to about minus 20 and then up to about minus 75. Okay, so, so it seems that, um, couple, well, let's bring, come back to what I was talking about. Um, so I said that at higher temperature, these isotopic effects kind of aren't really as prominent. Okay, there's differences in the energetics between these lighter uh, and heavier isotopes become less important. And so the product of a reaction is more like the reactants. Okay, in terms of their isotopic composition. And that's exactly what we see here, right? So thermogenic gas is formed at high temperatures, and its isotopic composition is more like that starting kerogen. Okay. Now, uh, biological methane okay, over here um, is formed at lower temperatures, so you see more of an isotopic shift, right? This is a larger difference okay, relative to that source kerogen. Now, um, these two uh, fields kind of fall out separately, uh, CO2 reduction and acetate fermentation. And the reason for that is because basically the, the carbon and hydrogen that go into making up the methane that's formed by CO2 reduction originates from uh, along different chemical pathways okay, in each of these different fields. So that creates these distinctly different uh, regions where methane uh, isotopes fall out, right? Depending on how it was produced. Okay, and what I'm um, one of the things I, I want you to know is that what I'm giving you here is is sort of a uh, the traditional interpretation for these isotopes. I think um, what we found out is they're not maybe as reliable as we initially believed, um, but in any case, they they do help us get a handle on this. Okay, so let's go back to uh, this slide. Okay, so here we are. Um, these data points 
are from some gas samples that I collected or that were collected from unconventional reservoirs, so both coal and shale. Uh, and as you can see, they fall out into these three different uh, regions that I've, I've defined here. And in some cases, they kind of plot in between. So a couple of things to bear in mind is that the gas that's in these samples wasn't necessarily all produced the same way. It could be a mixture of gases. Some of it was produced thermogenically. Some of it was produced by CO2 reduction. In the Michigan Basin, for example, um, if you start out along the northern edge of uh, the gas, gas fields that, are, that tap the Antrim shale, uh, most of the gas is produced biologically. But as you go further south in the basin, you end up getting more and more thermogenic gas. And so there's a transition, transition zone where you basically have some combination of both in your samples. Okay, so that's how you can end up uh, falling in between or uh, ranging in isotopic composition. Okay, and then the other important thing to note is that if oxidation occurs, if microbes use this methane as, uh, as an electron donor, if they oxidize it, that affects the isotopic composition of the residual methane that's present. Okay, so that can move things around on here as well. In any case, like I said, this is sort of the, trans the traditional interpretation of these relationships. And uh, um, it's not perfect, but it does help us get a handle on this. And I think that uh, there's going to be some really cool research that comes out in the next decade or so that um, helps us learn more about these isotope systematics. Oops. Okay. So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, end this video. Um, in the next video, we're going to talk about controls on the rate of methanogenesis, uh, and specifically, we're going to focus on unconventional natural gas reservoirs. Okay, thank you.